Before you click out of this video, I get it, but hang in there. When I first learned about restorative practices, I was thinking that it was just the latest fad in public education, but I gave it a chance. And I've been able to adapt it to an orchestra classroom pretty well. And as orchestra teachers, if we see a bow hold, we fix it. We show the student how to hold the bow right. If we hear an F sharp instead of an F natural, we teach the student about finger patterns. I've made over 200 videos on technical instruction on this channel, but how often do we think about students and their social needs? If a student has an underdeveloped social skill, how do we teach them? A lot of you might already be using restorative practices in some form in your classroom, and it might just be valuable to formalize your knowledge or gather some ideas, and I, I bet you'll come up with some ideas of your own that will fit your classroom the best. And as we know, values are at the base of the pyramid and everything that we do comes back to values. In my last video, I went over restorative practices from a 30,000 foot view, the history, the general application, the big picture stuff. In this video, I'm gonna show you what restorative practices might look like in an orchestra classroom. Do you have behavior problems? I don't have behavior problems in my classes. I'm an orchestra teacher. And even more than that, I'm a high school orchestra teacher. Okay, ever? You never have student behavior issues? You know, yeah, usually by the time they get to high school, they're here because they wanna be and they're, they're self-motivated and they wanna get the most out of orchestra. But every once in a while, a student goes out of bounds and we have to deal with it. In middle and elementary school, there are a lot more behavioral issues. And in that age range, students are less developed socially and we can either teach them or remove them. Now, in the traditional system, what do we do? A student misbehaves, they're disruptive, and we give them a referral and send them to the principal's office. Well, what happens? They come back with the fear of God in them and they become perfect little angels, right? Now, I can count the number of referrals that I've written on one hand in my 20 years of teaching. And I can tell you, they've had zero impact on student behavior. One of the advantages that I've had getting to go around and help other teachers in other school districts is I see a lot of different strategies for managing behavior. And hey, you have what works, you do you. But uh, I also see stuff that maybe could be tweaked to work a little bit better. You know, kind of these systems that are pretty punitive, to be honest, and you know, they, a lot of negative reinforcement. I've seen writing assignments, you know, and where you basically copy out of a music dictionary or a lunch detention. And let's face it, for lunch detention, that's kind of punishment for you at the same time, right? I've seen orchestra teachers prescribe extra practices punishment, which I don't get because we should try to encourage practicing, right? So why should it be punishment? You know, I've seen grade reduction and so on. Does that stuff work? You know, it has mixed results. Some, for some people it works, for some people it doesn't. You know, for some programs it works, for some kids it works, and for others it doesn't. So I don't know, but restorative practices is just another tool to have in your tool belt to see if you can fix the problem at the root of the cause. And, you know, I think that the whole parent conference thing gets a lot closer because at least, you know, we're talking about the student and, you know, trying to develop a plan. But, you know, parents can be intimidating and a lot of teachers don't want to reach out. You know, a lot of people want to avoid conflict. And on the other side of it, a lot of parents don't want to hear that their child isn't perfect and they can react unkindly. So here's an example of an issue and, and we can just examine it. So. We have a group of students that are running to class. You know, this is very common, especially in elementary and middle school. Students have a lot of energy and they just want to run to class. So in, in one case, the teacher says, no running, and they get a lunch detention for running because that's the school policy, and then they don't run anymore. Well, does it work? Maybe. Maybe they don't run to class anymore, but what could have happened? What if you tried some restorative practices? So let's just sit down with these kids and ask them why they were running. Okay, they're running because they're excited and they wanna to get to your class. They're running because they have a lot of energy. They're running because it's fun to run. So using the detention method, you just punish the kids for being energetic, for having fun, and for getting to your class on time. So was that your intention? Do you, you wanna teach your students that 
orchestra isn't fun, that you shouldn't be energetic, that you should be late. Okay, so you've identified the reason for the running. Now let's address the damage. Who was hurt? Okay, in this case, nobody was hurt. We were just running. And it's a stupid rule, right? Okay, nobody was hurt this time, but in the future, could somebody possibly have been hurt? Could you have been hurt? So maybe rules based on hypotheticals are pretty weak, so we might dig a little deeper and we might bring up Immanuel Kant. Okay, let's iterate this out to the rest of the school. What if everybody just ran to class all the time? Uh, well, there'd be no more tardies, yes, but it would also be pretty chaotic, right? Of course. So why do roads have speed limits? Okay, now they're starting to understand. Now we're starting to figure out why we have these rules and maybe get them to change their behavior that way. You know, this time there was no victim, so no big deal. But if we recognize that one day we could hurt somebody and there might be medical bills and there might be lasting physical damage and all that bad stuff, well, now we understand the reason for the rule and we can modify behavior. Okay, but also let's look at the broader scope of this. What about the other students that saw you running and said, hey, that looks like fun, I'm gonna run too. And then more and more students are running, it's more chaos, more chances for injury, right? So they become a part of the circle and then we continue to educate, you know, see, you know, maybe that could be something you could try out. Maybe if, if you use circles and you use restorative practices, you could make a classroom full of teachers that could be the solutions rather than the problems. And in my next video, I'm gonna talk about how to use circles for students who aren't in trouble to get conversations going and transform your teaching environment. So I'll see you then. <laughs>